Welcome to another part of uh, Kubernetes learning series. In part one, we focused on Kubernetes and workloads in general, along with some open source tools. Today, in part two, we'll focus on approaches for attacking a Kubernetes cluster from a red teaming perspective. This also helps in understanding how an attacker thinks and their mindset while exploiting Kubernetes clusters. Divyanshu, welcome back to the show. Looking forward to this uh, exciting part. So I'll just very quickly explain what is this application. So it is just taking a get and post request. Mm -hmm. It will create a password via taking your uh, email and password. It will help you get the password based on the okay. uh, whatever email you will provide uh, in the parameter. And there is the mm -hmm. uh, functionality which is still in the beta, which is redirect. And it is using a tiny mm -hmm. DB. And okay. uh, these are some libraries which I've mm -hmm. mentioned, which I've used for this application. So this is an open source application. Uh, I'll I'll give you the link uh, which you can okay. paste it in the uh, no, uh, section and everyone can go and play. so I'll just open the source code although okay. I'm not explaining. Sure. So this is the insecure Python app. Yeah. It is very easy to deploy and like mm -hmm. it is like uh, a very extremely simple application. I just wanted to have for my Kubernetes cluster. If you'll see, it is just one twenty nine lines of code, right? So and it helped uh, basically <laughs> me or everyone around me to understand how how to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. So, and rest, right. uh, I think we have already gone through these uh, files. So I'll just quickly go to the uh, our our uh, application it, card it. where I'll try to uh, I'll I'll use this HTTP mm -hmm. I uh, for uh, connecting to this application via CLI so that I can very quickly uh, no uh, walk you okay. through how I'm I'm connecting to these APIs. So we can also do it via like okay. UI also, but uh, I I'll prefer CLI because you no know, we are doing everything on the CLI, so it would be easy for me to explain. So I'll just sure sure yeah go. makes sense. I'll quickly I have I've, I've deployed this, so it is an API testing client uh, which uh, we'll use, and I'll just copy paste these commands and mm -hmm. I'll create a file so that I can. To everyone. So mm -hmm. instead of uh, using the domain right now, I'm using the IP. So I'll, I'll just replace this with the IP. So this is my first command. If you'll see, and I'll okay. remove the part. So you'll see HTTP get. So I'm just sending the get request. That would be my first request. And then I'll try mm -hmm. to create the password and uh, the via my email. So I'll just replace this part and I'll replace it with my values. And mm -hmm. now you can see I'm sending a post request. Of, uh, mm -hmm. to the uh, create password endpoint using mm -hmm. uh, uh, like a uh, uh, test email and the password mm -hmm. is my password. So obviously because it's an insecure application, okay. so that's why it is taking no easy password. It is not doing <laughs> anything. <laughs> so like uh, the next command is... Uh, it is it's not recommended uh, for our audience. Correct. Correct. So I don't want folks creating, you no know, <laughs> using this <laughs> application for any... Uh, production or any kind of deployment. Right. So the next part mm -hmm. is it is trying to get the password via get password API. And I'm, I just have to pass the email, which I've used to create okay. the password. And uh, mm -hmm. then the last part is okay. kind of a S SSRF scenario, which I've uh, like uh, intentionally you know, uh, created to show how it would work. Because uh, if, mm -hmm. if I'm, I'm showing this or if I'm deploying this application in the EKS, right, in those cases, I would be able to uh, like hit that mm -hmm. uh, metadata endpoint and get the credentials. So although in this right, uh, scenario, right. in this lab, this is not required. We won't be uh, like doing this. Uh, instead, we would be going to uh, the next part mm -hmm. uh, where we would have an RC and okay. I'll show you the RC part here itself. So uh, let me show you first. So there is okay. this app route. You will see, right? There is this date endpoint, which uh, basically... Uh, in in the trainings or in the workshops, uh, like the party participants, basically they try to read the source code and uh, they try to find out which application, like which endpoint is vulnerable to RC or the command execution. But uh, I'm I'm just uh, no explaining right. the same. So you can see there mm -hmm. is a date endpoint which is uh, taking exec as the parameter, mm -hmm. and then uh, it is having a sub process uh -huh. dot open no, which is uh, causing the uh, like the mm -hmm. command injection. And there is no sanitization or any mm -hmm. kind of validation. So it will take whatever I'll pass. Right? Anything. Correct. Right. So right. I'll just quickly create the... Uh, 
so i'll i'll just show you it is uh, basically a date and the exif so we just need mm-hmm. two values so i'll just have a date as the end point then uh, i'll have uh, mm-hmm. exif equal to ls so okay so we were I, running I, a command remotely on the server correct correct so first i'll try uh, to yeah. show okay. the application itself uh, from the cli so mm-hmm. i try to access it so you'll see it is uh, showing me the whole content that in secure password manager and like because mm-hmm. it's in the cli now i'll try to create the password mm-hmm. uh, for the email uh, so you can see it is showing success password added to the manager and then the next mm-hmm. is i'll try to get password for the user at the rate gmail.com and mm-hmm. it is saying the email is this the password is this and right. uh, like uh, last i'll directly come to this rc part and i'll try to see if uh, it is vulnerable to rc although in real world we have to test and no try multiple ways you can see right i am able to do an ls <laughs> and i you can see there is a docker file jenkins file there are so many things right now i can start uh, reading the requirements.txt right. right. maybe the db.json jenkins mm-hmm. file so we we have multiple kind of data here right so we can try to exploit and see yeah. uh, like i i'll show you couple of more ways so how we'll get to know if we are inside the uh, like kubernetes so we'll do a print env here so when i'll do this command it will show me mm-hmm. the output you'll see uh, like the moment output is right in on is on the terminal you can see a kubernetes port is there a kubernetes service port is there right uh, vulnerable service full port so all these things you can so see so all the right? environment variables correct, correct. you can find out so, from here correct so whenever kubernetes so if there is a if there is a any secrets or anything also you can access that right correct 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 so that is why if you are injecting secrets here it would come directly in the environment variables although uh, we yeah. have not done that so it is not there hopefully so <laughs> but it also gives us an idea that it is not a docker application rather it is a container or a pod running inside a kubernetes cluster if you'll see from the output right so it would mm-hmm. give multiple things from here like it Correct. would give me the uh, like the endpoint itself and uh, like uh, what language is used so there you will get so mm-hmm. many things just by looking into the environment variable so this is the easiest way of fingerprinting or finding whether mm-hmm. once i have an rc whether my application is running on the host itself or on the cluster or the kubernetes itself so based on that we can basically decide which attack path mm-hmm. i want to go right so right right is uh, like the basic setup or uh, and the rc now i'll try to uh, exploit this application mm-hmm. so i'll i'll just mm-hmm. redeploy uh, python pip just because i don't want to like have a error again so that is why I'll, I'll redeploy if it is not there and mm-hmm. i i think pip was not there sure. because i will be uh, de- using one more tool uh, which is which is called as spawn cat okay it is very much similar to netcat for uh-huh. the reverse shell but a little bit advanced and easy to use like mm-hmm. netcat is due to binaries and versions you know sometimes it is difficult and even a uh, folks will have different version of netcat right so there there can be some kind of confusion mm-hmm. between the students or the people who are basically following this that uh, my netcat is not working right. i right. do have a netcat so that's why i'm using a different tool uh, which is again an uh, right. open source okay. and you can just see on the github and uh, you can read the docs you can see how it works and everything so it is deployed okay. now I'll, as an attacker i'll just open my reverse shell uh, basically i'll i'll uh, start my listener before i open the reverse shell so i'll just uh, do this uh, so i'm i'm listening on 0.0.0 and the port is 8182 and it is saying that uh, bound to this uh, no a uh, specific ip and the port okay let me close this mm-hmm. and then um, like this side is from the victim so let's suppose uh, uh, we have mm-hmm. found an rc like actually we have found an rc so i'll just try to uh, have the mm-hmm. python payload so i'll just copy paste that python payload and uh, just uh, wrap the line sure. so you'll see here right i am just saying uh, 
whichever port uh, like i want to have the reversal then this is the command for uh, getting the reversal i'm just sending the bin bash uh, to that ah. current ip so you will see right mm -hmm. i'm using for live config in real world here i have to put the attacker's ip or like attacker would put his ip right now we are mm -hmm. on the same machine so that is why i'm putting the for live config so this command will basically uh, correct, print correct. everything for me on the terminal uh, which i can easily go and copy paste so that is why uh, i have just uh, created this you will see mm -hmm. it is now encoding everything so no uh, then it would be very easy for me to just paste the mm -hmm. command here and just uh, send it right so without any hassle and i already right. have my uh, reverse shell run uh, listener running sorry Uh, mm -hmm. And when I'll, uh, say, yeah. I think I have, I think <laughs> I copied the whole line. So just let me uh, get this one. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. So now uh, you will see when I'll go to this, you can see right. Uh, we have received a communication from eighty into zero seven nine nine one four one one four, which is obviously the same mm -hmm. IP from where I'm running. But in real scenario, this would be the victim's correct, IP correct. from where the reverse shell or the shell would come. So now I'll hit Control D correct. and I'll get the regular regular shell. So you can see now I'm inside the vulnerable app deployment pool. So this is mm -hmm. not our regular terminal; it is the container or the pod uh, where I've got the access. So now I'll just so this is very much app. like uh, doing a shell into one of the containers, but from a remote. Uh, location right, altogether, right. right? Without having any access to the cube cutl permissions or anything like that. Correct. So now we'll see from here. Okay. See the first thing you can see, right? Are uh, these container is uh, running as root. So because of which uh, we mm -hmm. would have more privileges. Now I can install anything. I can do apt update. Uh, so without those these privileges of root, I I would be able to do that, right? So now you can see I was correct, able to correct. run an apt update. So now I can install anything. So here, mm -hmm. uh, as you have seen till now, that we uh, we were using uh, a cube CTL. So definitely, I would I would like to know install the cube CTL. Mm -hmm. And before that, uh, as it is mentioned here, also I'll just uh, hit an env. A uh, print env and env both are almost the same commands, and it will mm -hmm. give me the environment variables. And then the next right. is uh, I can try to install the mm -hmm. nmap. Uh, so because of the time constraint, I'm not doing that. And uh, curl, I would install uh, because mm -hmm. I want to install the cube CTL binary. As we know that no, we are using cube CTL mm -hmm. to connect to the Kubernetes cluster, and uh, uh, this uh, there was a service account mounted. So uh, I'll I'll just use this mm -hmm. cube CTL uh, curl to download the cube CTL binary and install it in the uh, path okay. so that I can access uh, like connect to the Kubernetes cluster via cube CTL. And I'm, I'm just closing this. And I'm I'm just using the install command to install it. This would sure, do sure. everything for me. Now, if I'll see, if I'll run this cube ctl auth can I list? So this command would give me like what mm -hmm. I can do, right? So you can see because I had everything star star. So now right, it's giving right. me that I have all the permissions. I can do get. These are the APIs. I can like get whatever I want. I have full uh, control over the cluster because I was. Uh, able to install the cube CTL. Then on the top of that, I was having an mm -hmm. RBAC with full permission. So because I had full permissions, now I can go and right. create the cluster. I can delete it. I can do whatever I want, right? So now I'll show. So it's uh, very much like an admin in correct, any correct. cloud environment, right? Correct. Right. Right. So here yeah. you'll see I've I've done an end map. So which I'm not doing, but I'll show you one last command, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. would. Uh, Help us to get an mm -hmm. idea. So, if you will see cluster info, I am now able okay. to dump the cluster info. I am able to get the nodes and pods and services, everything, right? So, this mm -hmm. see. So now right. I have complete access. I can do whatever I want. So, this is a complete uh, Kubernetes or like the cluster right. compromise scenario. So now, because I have full permission, I can go and uh, right. maybe create a, another pod or delete everything, right? So mm -hmm. this is the part where we have completed yeah. our so reverse shell. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you mm -hmm. were saying something, Kushal. No, 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 I was saying that uh, no. Two, we look at two things, right? One is the remote code execution vulnerability, and from that we could all the way get to reverse shell, and now you have complete uh, control of the cluster. Correct. Correct. 
so plus if you will see like the yaml there was no like uh, no uh, restriction on the deployment of the container itself so i was able to like this pod was deployed as a root right it was running as a root so when the attacker got the access mm-hmm. uh, i was able Correct. to run commands as root so this is actually the real world scenario which i have tested and uh, mm-hmm. did in the uh, like in one of my pen testing engagement where i did a nuclei scan on the uh, right uh, mm-hmm. the uh, domains and from there i was able to get inside a container mm-hmm. and because the container itself was running as root so i got uh, uh-huh. i just did an exec in, into an mm-hmm. another container and it was in cloud environment so there that uh, that uh, container was having uh, no uh, full permissions like the admin policy was attached so it led to an aws uh, no a compromise <laughs> in that case so just because i had okay. like uh, right, right. no rc in the application then there was an uh, full r bank there the application was uh, the container was running as root i was able to take over the entire aws mm-hmm. so this is this is how bad yeah, these you know, uh, misconfigurations are so i think uh, this is pretty much mm-hmm. it uh, we this is like from the part of uh, Uh, are back and you no know, exploiting a parent application we have done that and now in the next part uh, we would see uh, mm-hmm. the container breakout scenario so i'm not going to use the same container i would be showing a different container where we would just focus mm-hmm. on the breakout scenario but once we have uh, exploited the container now from okay. here like if i want to go to the host right if i want to get the complete host access or my machine mm-hmm. access or my server access So in those cases, I need to mm-hmm. check and find a way to break out of this uh, container and get into the uh, host on which uh, this uh, container is run or the pod is running. This cluster is running. Yeah, correct, correct. So uh, this is the uh, next scenario. So these are some common breakout scenarios. If we, uh, if I'll read it out, PID like the process ID mounting, the network mm-hmm. mounting, IPC two. So IPC is just the inter-process communication namespace. so this namespace is shared between mm-hmm. the multiple pod so suppose my x pod is having uh, no ipc2 mm-hmm. and there is an malicious pod uh, running with uh, no uh, the ipc2 they both would have the shared uh, inter process communication and if any secret is stored by x pod to right. that place malicious pod also can go and read it mm-hmm. so that is why this is bad plus mm-hmm. the volume mount uh, which we would see where we i am going to mount the uh, mm-hmm. host volume and then couple of uh, like the privilege to where i am giving excessive privileges uh, to my containers then docker in docker like this is how basically our kind is running right now but in the scenarios where we don't have kind right, right? or in the real applications where we don't use kind in those cases if i have access to this docker mm-hmm. mount socket or the where i can directly run the docker command inside the pod in those cases i can create another docker mm-hmm. or i can no directly delete all the containers and do much more because i would have access to the docker uh, uh, socket and from there i can communicate to the docker uh, like a uh, sock which is basically having uh, more permission directly correct correct right Then, so here uh, 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 here you have listed uh, 10 to 11 uh, container breakout scenarios uh, is this the finite list or there are more such scenarios which can be used by attackers No, no. There are more scenarios. Plus, attackers are finding zero days also, right? If I'll find a zero day which gives me explicit uh, container breakout, like if I have found any process which is running into the mm-hmm. container and the same process may be uh, used in the host, and I have found some way maybe via no brute forcing mm-hmm. or uh, any way I uh, during via race condition or or uh, some way I was able to access the host, right? uh this would lead to a container breakout so mm-hmm. there are more advanced uh, injections possible where you you have to write the uh, mm-hmm. shell in the c language and then try to exploit it because these are extremely simple to demonstrate and mm, like these are extremely common in the current infrastructure right. that is why i have mentioned these scenarios okay makes sense mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, so out of these, which one you want to maybe show today from a breakout? I'll show, uh, I'll, I'll show this host volume mount path one and this unauthenticated Kubernetes dashboard. Okay, because for the dashboard, I have already right. deployed this dashboard, so that is why I don't have to redeploy it. And this, mm-hmm. 
I have a YAML for this host volume mount, so that is why I would show that as well. Like, uh, and okay. host volume mount and privilege two are uh, very much similar. I'll I'll explain the difference when I'll start the lab itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to okay. thank Bishop Cox. I have taken these uh, breakout scenarios from their GitHub. So just I just want to give them the credit. Like I have not created these YAML. So I'm just I'm just using this yeah. it for our scenario. Okay. Well, when we when we publish the video, we'll make sure to tag them as well so that they okay. get the due credit. Cool. So this is All the right. host volume uh, mount. So uh, host volume mount container breakout <laughs> refers to the vulnerability where I'm mounting the host file system into the uh, pod or into the container. An attacker is able to gain the unauthorized mm -hmm. access of the host file system. So, uh, so you sort of have access to the entire file system on the host not just the not just what the container has by default access correct correct this is true so i'm just going into the uh, okay. directory where i have my uh, this host pod uh, dot yaml and uh, mm -hmm. i'll quickly explain this as okay. well okay so just let me reconfirm it's 4.5 and then host volume so this is uh, the deployment mm -hmm. is pod. I just won't, don't want to bring this up again. And the image type is Alpine. And uh, okay. you can see I'm mounting uh, on mm -hmm. the slash host. And on the host, I'm mounting my uh, root. Mm -hmm. So I'm mounting the root directory of the host uh, to the slash host. So because I'm mounting the root, so whatever would ah, inside okay. uh, would stay inside the uh, root. That is right. Everything like what everything is inside this slash itself. So from the Correct. container or from the pod, I would be able to access Correct. everything. So we'll just uh, quickly see the right. scenario. I'll just, uh, I've explained the uh, YAML. So I just apply this. We can either create or do an apply mm -hmm. here. So both works. Uh, apply is usually uh, once we have okay. configured or created something when we want to reapply, we use apply, but I am using it here itself. So you can see the host pod, pod, pod is created and uh, okay. for the Post exploitation, I'll I'll do a CD into that uh, mounted slash host path and do an LS uh, from the container or mm -hmm. from the pod which we are running right now. So I'll do it very quickly. Uh, you can see uh, it, okay. it is showing me all these uh, files or uh, these are the uh, file system of the host itself. Now I'll create a file uh, mm -hmm. and and inside the uh, my uh, host file system. So uh, right now it won't be my EC2 instance. Mm -hmm. It would be my uh, uh, Docker container, which is on which uh, this uh, node is running because we are running kind, right? So kind uh, node is running on the top of correct, another correct. container. So it would basically access the container, not the EC2 host, mm -hmm. uh, like just so that people are not confused, like why it won't be visible from the EC2. Like in real scenario, it mm -hmm. would be visible on the host operating system. Or on the main server where uh, our uh, the pod where our pod is running. Correct. So I just created this file, mm -hmm. and now uh, I'll I'll access uh, this file again mm -hmm. uh, from our uh, host. Okay. So this command I'll just uh, explain the command as well. So here I'm you can see I'm I'm just listing the uh, pod and uh, the node on which my pod is running. Mm -hmm. Then I'm doing a Docker ps. Okay. And from there, I'm getting the node name mm -hmm. and you can see I'm doing a Docker exec and mm -hmm. trying to cat that file, which we have created via uh, our uh, no, um, kubectl. Like basically uh, the pod was running and we were right. able to uh, create a file here. Now I'm trying to access the same file via Docker mm -hmm. exec because kind is running on the Docker. So you can see I was able to access this file via Docker right. itself. So here uh, it was possible mm -hmm. to break out of the uh, host uh, ho of that container and access the host file system which is our uh, containers uh, right. file system where our node is running so uh, right. again I'll, I'll so you could create and you could access a file uh, sorry you could access the root directory you could create a file in the correct. root directory and later correct. on we could read from it as well correct correct so this is the same thing which is okay. mentioned. I'm just reading it out. Get the node name from the host pod for, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, get container ID and then execute the cat, cat host file command mm -hmm. inside the container. This is the same thing, uh, but we have discussed uh, right now. 
so this was okay. the easiest container breakout if you see just because uh, no uh, uh, like a team or someone who uh, did the host path and mounted everything right uh, slash so that is why mm-hmm. it was possible for me mm-hmm. as an attacker to get access to the file system because i have access to the entire file system i can make any changes try right. so i'll just go and quickly delete this lab and uh, we'll move to the next section where mm-hmm. i have the privilege to so privilege to gives uh, like okay. on the pod level uh, it bypasses the security boundaries and gives extra permissions like the kernel level setting uh, to the uh, pod which is running so i'll again show you okay. the uh, yaml uh, before we so it's talk more about, like a uh, mm-hmm. uh, container with uh, elevated privileges right correct correct so i'll just explain you the uh, line so here in the security context we have mentioned privilege to that means i'm telling that my pod is running mm-hmm. with extra privileges or the extra capabilities and rest right. everything is same like it is just a pod uh, image ubuntu mm-hmm. and this is just uh, no i'm i'm running it in the loop so that my pod is not dying so alive yeah so i'll i'll just apply uh, this uh, Uh, malicious uh, yaml and it the, the pod is created now when i'll i'll do the couple of commands i'll explain the command here itself so first i'll see uh, first i'll see that lsblk like what are the you uh, know uh, file system which is present via this lsblk command this is a classic mm-hmm. linux command and you can see this the name is xvdba1 okay and uh, then i'll create mm-hmm. the uh, host directory uh basically uh, if you'll see here okay. uh, this is exactly the same uh, thing which we did in the our uh, no uh, host volume scenario like there i was writing in the yaml itself that mm-hmm. i am mounting uh, like i have a slash host and i'm mounting into the uh, slash root because i have elevated privileges right mm-hmm. now with privilege to i'll create a directly uh, direct right. a directory here and now i'll do the same thing Mm-hmm. i'll again if you will see the next command i'm again mounting it uh, my uh, like xvdba1 mm-hmm. onto that uh, slash host and you will see there okay. was no error so this was possible because i had elevated privileges right and i'll run a right. ch root so ch root will give uh, uh, basically uh, this uh, slash host uh, its shell uh, it is just to uh, no change the root and now mm-hmm. you will see i am i am having this uh, directly mm-hmm. i am inside uh, uh, some some you no know, root now uh, we don't know still what it is but uh, in our reality this is our node where our container is running we were successfully able to break out here right. and now if i'll do an uh, ls okay. and uh, i i'll show you so you will see uh, it is even uh, because uh, right now my you no know, uh, ec2 instance is are shared with the node and my node is sharing the same with the container or the pod so that is why in this scenario mm-hmm. i was able to see the uh, no uh, like my ec2 data like this is the course which uh, right now we are accessing mm-hmm. so that is that right, was right. possible because uh, no i had access uh, via the privilege to and now i can go and privilege container to- yeah correct so this is how the privileged uh, no uh, breakout scenario okay. works so these are very easy to learn and understand scenario and uh, like uh, the bishop box has given couple mm-hmm. of more here so if anyone is interested they can go and read all these scenarios okay. they have a huge list like there are total 7 uh, or 8 scenarios ah, uh, lovely which yeah basically uh, which helps uh, anyone to understand how the basic breakout scenarios would work then there are some cves which came uh, no in the last years like runc okay. uh, so all these things like if anyone is interested they can read and try to check all these things in the real world like whether these vulnerabilities are present and they can try to mm-hmm. basically uh, use these uh, no uh, issues uh, during the pen test so now coming to the last okay. attack uh, which we will uh, see in this demo so i would just uh, directly mm-hmm. go into the uh, end point so you will see this is the kubernetes dashboard so whenever the uh, like applications are deployed in the kubernetes uh, devops or the sre guys they also deploy a kubernetes dashboard so when uh, the there is a misconfiguration where uh, okay. like 
वी अलाउ नो स्किप और वी अलाउ अनोनिमस लॉग इन इन टू दूबरनेटिस डैशबोर्ड we have this skip button if i'll zoom out uh, you mm-hmm. see there is this skip button so if the vulnerability is not there you will see a kubernetes dashboard right. exposed but there won't be this skip button because this skip button is present i can simply okay. go and click on this skip and for me this will skip and this will show me everything so now i can see uh, all the containers <laughs> running you can see polgo is running right uh, i can see the type of workload service config map mm-hmm. cluster so now you'll see from here also i have access to everything so this is a correct, very correct. Like, uh, like even though there was that authentication page you could correct. bypass that right in a way because correct. you did not have to provide any authentication because you could skip okay correct. so in real yaml which is provided by the kubernetes uh, this uh, on the github there is this uh, skip button or this misconfiguration is not there because i was demonstrating it in the lab so that is why explicitly okay. i have created this setup so if mm-hmm. a kubernetes dashboard is running maybe a very old okay. version or someone has explicitly you know a created this misconfiguration then only this would exist or if they have some specific use case i don't know what but okay. if they have some some bad use case you no know, uh, in those cases only this would uh, this skip <laughs> button would appear <laughs> so this uh, okay. brings us oh, which makes sense and i was about to ask you that like why would somebody have the skip button okay. if you want to enforce authentication but okay it now it is clear maybe like uh, no you can or uh, we can uh, try to access shodan and see uh, based on the uh, fingerprinting if we have something in the uh, real environment <laughs> i don't want to show, show this in the mm-hmm. rr uh, no uh, workshop because uh, i don't want to right, someone right. to get exploited so anyway uh, this is uh, correct correct we have completed the attack part and it brings us to the end of uh, mm-hmm. how we attack the kubernetes uh, infrastructure so these are some basic attacks and uh, no uh, post exploitation techniques which we have talked about so over to you purushottam if you have any question okay. anything because uh, like this was too much for the you no know, uh, for for the first time to see and then uh, like uh, going through all these at once yeah so th- i have many questions some around the attack itself and mostly around the defense side so uh, you showed few things right remote code execution the rbac policies where you have star uh, permissions uh, mm-hmm. is there any scenario where these are legitimate Uh, yes, because so we can understand the, that yeah ideally uh, this is not best practice uh, that you should have host access or you should have star dot star permissions but is there any um, any scenario where you see that that is like bus- from a business perspective it is okay so from business perspective i don't think this should be uh, no uh, required maybe in the testing or when the application uh, developers application developers are getting started they can have this in their test environment mm-hmm. although they should not expose it publicly but if they want to test or they want to understand how okay. these things are working in those cases only they should have this like real world scenario won't have something where it mm-hmm. is uh, misconfigured right uh, like all the applications need need a specific mm-hmm. access maybe to a specific pod or the namespace so it would be very specific like i don't think any pod would go and create any right. pod right so those things are not required mm-hmm. so correct okay uh the other question that i have is you mentioned about three types of ways to uh, sort of enable uh, or create a service right uh, mm-hmm. node port cluster ip load balancer mm-hmm. uh, when you are let's say if i am deploy if i am creating a cluster and uh, deploying it in aws mm-hmm. in which scenarios you would suggest me use uh, cluster ip and in which scenarios you would suggest me use load balancer whenever we have an application and i directly want to act, like want it to be accessed outside the uh, no uh, from the external environment or like from the internet in those cases we can have the uh, load balancer mm-hmm. so if i'll put load balancer right now in this yaml where we had this sample app mm-hmm. uh, if you will see this uh, the mm-hmm. type is node port if i'll mention the uh, like load balancer this won't come up because in bare metal we don't have or like on mm-hmm. the uh, ec2 we don't have any like uh, a load balancer that right? it is explicit to the cloud environment correct so there it would create a cloud mm-hmm. uh, load balancer for you uh, i'll be like aws and it would directly map your container with that 
so your application would be accessible directly okay. like you don't have to do explicit mapping like in the case of node port okay. it will give you an public ip like if it is uh, mm-hmm. uh, if you are not in the uh, private subnet and you have that public ip pool so in that case you will get this right. public ip and you your uh, application mm-hmm. would be accessible outside the cluster like if it is uh, within the private subnet obviously you won't be able to access it but if it is accessible like your networking mm-hmm. configuration allows that uh, public uh, no uh, access and uh, that this is the node port in that mm. case uh, my uh, pod would be accessible outside the uh, like uh, n- n- uh, this cluster itself and when we talk about the cluster ip it is okay. within the cluster like i have uh, pod 1 and pod 2 running within the cluster and i ah. want some kind of communication happening like a micro service which wants to talk internally okay. right in that case i will have cluster ip where mm-hmm. the communication is happening within the cluster so that is is the, that is the okay. main difference between and- these types Okay. Mm-hmm. One follow-up question is uh, the load balancer, right? Let's say I have a, a user-facing app. I created a load balancer. It has to use some of the networking components of AWS, right? So that uh, the I the uh, I can access from the outside world. What mm-hmm. components are used, and do I need to do any special configuration for that? so a special configuration like it would be very much similar to any application running your nacl your private subnet your vpc and you no know, security group all these things needs to be in place right like it is how a generic application work like if mm-hmm. i will block all the network access like i would give again an analogy that if i have my main door locked right and everything inside uh, my house mm-hmm. is open then also anyone can't come uh, inside my house because the main door itself is locked so that is very much similar because i have provided the networking access to like basically the communication the in- ingress and egress uh, the incoming or the outgoing traffic the uh, traffic flow won't happen although mm-hmm. my a- application is allowing but my network is not correct okay that that makes sense um uh, i think i have more questions uh, from a defense uh, perspective mm-hmm. one last question that i have is uh like whatever uh, setup we saw would mm-hmm. the same apply to a windows based uh let's say os if your host os is windows mm-hmm. uh will everything work uh let's say if i create the service the uh the application uh, like all the yamls that you showed right will they work mm-hmm. as is or we need to make any changes for in that scenario so i haven't used windows much or like i haven't seen on the server side anyone using windows but if we'll talk about the kubernetes it should run in the similar way because i haven't seen uh, all these things in the okay. reality so i exactly don't know the answer because uh, for dot net and all okay. those you know uh, applications maybe there would be some specific changes required maybe on the host level but on the network level everything would be same right so maybe on the configuration right. side okay. something would change but i'm not sure about that mm-hmm. i need to check okay uh, that that's fair <laughs> no no that that's fair that's understandable and i have seen something very similar that most of the uh, kubernetes practitioners use uh, like linux based or ubuntu based uh, uh, host services so that should cover majority of the uh, landscape uh okay so i think i uh, all of my questions around the attack side uh, i have mm-hmm. got answered uh, um, so once we go into the defense side i'll have more uh, question got it sure so thank you everyone for joining us in the part 2 of this workshop Uh, this is part two of a multi-part series focusing on Kubernetes learning, attack, and defense. We hope you found part two informative and 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 engaging. Stay tuned for part three, where we'll dive deeper into practical strategies of defending a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, that gives us an understanding of how how and what are some of the best practices to follow when defending Kubernetes clusters from attackers. See you soon. Thank you.